<laughs> so it's Monday morning. I sold my slack and I bought jets. Did you really? I thought you were joking. No, I really did. I'm keeping a tight leash. I have a stop in at today's lows. If it goes below today's today's lows, I'm out. Listen, what a new this thing is. <laughs> this thing is guilty until proven innocent. Okay, so I'm I'm not giving it much here, room to run here's at a, all. Like there was there was nine hundred million dollars poured into this thing, and it didn't really. I mean, obviously that's maybe a drop in the bucket. It didn't. It's not like that helped airline performance unless people sold out of the individual stocks and into the ETF to be more diverse or something. But I mean, again, is this another Robin Hood thing where this is just a bunch of degenerate gamblers that are pouring in? It's just wild to me that this is just such odd behavior during a bear market that you get something like this. Well, because this is so weird because people, the airlines are such a part of our life. Like nobody thinks people that are buying this can't picture United, American, JetBlue not being here or going bankrupt. Obviously, they could. But, I mean, do you, do you think that the airlines wish that people would buy their debt like this? If there was like a an airline's debt ETF or something, that like, wouldn't that help them more than this this equity one? Like, you wonder if they like, man, I wish we could get some people to give us that money for for debt purposes. But like in the after the two thousand eight crisis, people weren't pouring into the financials like XLF like this, were they? Or the three times levered financial? Well, but that's not really. A, I mean, I hear you. That's not a apples to apples because financials were the epicenter of the crisis, whereas the airlines are an externality kind of. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like the airlines are now going to be starting to lay off people. It's so how long would you ride this thing for? Uh, let's see. Okay. So jets, I'm, I'm going to be a seller between 18 and 20, but more likely I will get stopped at. Okay. What, what's the price now? 1576. Okay. You got some like technical analysis, Fibonacci trends on this thing. No fibs, straight levels, bro. Okay, so they talked about how a lot of the uh, the the PPP loans and stuff from the government is is getting to the point where you're hitting the deadline where they can now let go of people, and I think a lot of some places are. So one of the things that seems weird. So this is from a Bloomberg article. They they talked about how how do some people get to keep their jobs during something like this, and some people get let go. So the question is, why don't some of these companies just slash? across the, the board and keep everyone, but just have everyone take a pick. And I've heard of a few local companies do that. They like on when this thing hit, within like 10 days, they said, all right, all upper level management, we're taking a 40% haircut and everyone's going to stay, but we're all taking a hit. And so this guy from this Truman Bully, who's from an economics professor at Yale, wrote a book on this. And it's like, why don't wages fall during recession, which is why this income thing going up. And this was published in 99. But he said, why do you lay off so many people? He's asked this to a, a manufacturing executive. Why do you lay off so many people rather than reducing pay? And his answer was, and he, the guy says, I should have made this title of my book. He says, to get the misery out the door. And so he said, it's sort of obvious, and I keep hearing the same thing all over the place. Um, you have to keep the core people working full time and keep their pay and to be to keep them loyal to the company and everyone else you sacrifice, which sounds okay, awful. That's cold, sounds, yes, it sounds awful. It, it makes a lot of business sense. Yes, unfortunately. But Instead of like we're all in this together, which, which you'd think in a time like this, unfortunately, I think a lot of companies probably do look at it that way, right? And yeah. say if we we're going to demoralize everyone if we give them a pay cut, but if we just demoralize a few people and cut them, it, they're not going to be around anymore. It's it's kind of a crazy way to look at the world, but it honestly, unfortunately, makes sense. Let's move on to listener questions. All right. I thought this was really good. My daughter wants to learn about investing. Uh, options are an outschool.com class or DIY. I'm not the best, but I've learned a lot listening to you guys and lots of reading. If you had three lessons or main ideas to get across to an interested 12 year old, what would they be? I think the idea that you can put your money into something. I remember learning this as a child. I, I put, when I was like 12 years old, I put like birthday money into a CD and just the idea of, of course you did. I know just the idea of thinking that you could put a thousand dollars into a CD and I was, I think I got 5%. And then in a year or two years or whatever it was, you'd get more than that Just and you didn't do anything. I think just that idea was mind-blowing to me. I think helping someone understand that, like earning interest and interest on interest, compound interest is not like the mind-blowing thing some people make it out to be. But just the idea that you can have your money work for you is, I, I think, something probably a lot of kids would be blown away at. Well, my I remember my father talking about compound interest, but it didn't take because I didn't see it. So I think that if you can give experiences instead of teaching, 
for a child that can that could stick. I need to think about this though. Uh, three main ideas. Maybe this is better for a blog post because it's hard to come up with thoughts on the fly. Uh, you once wrote three about ma- so, idea number two. Okay. Stock buybacks are the devil. Number three. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get back to this. Maybe in a blog post. 